Hi, my name is Pat Klusiewicz. I'm a graphic designer and self-taught 3D artist. I've been asked by Starlight Station to give a breakdown of my newest sci-fi prop. These are the final renders taken out of Sketchfab Screenshot Exporter. I'll be covering my workflow and just some thought processes while creating this project. The software covered was Maya, Photoshop, 3D Coat and Sketchfab. Maya was used for modelling and UVs, Photoshop for texture setup and painting, 3D Coat for baking maps and painting out scenes, and Sketchfab for presentation and final renders. So this project was created for weeks 3 and 4 of the CGMA Stylized Game Assets course with Ashley Warner. The tasks in weeks 3 and 4 was to concept and produce a sci-fi prop. I learned a really great deal, not just in weeks 3 and 4 but throughout the 10 week course. Ashley was a really great teacher and she was super helpful. I also met a lot of really cool people in my class which was really great. It's definitely a you get out what you put in type scenario. If you can give it 110% you won't regret it. If you've been on the fence about it, I can't recommend it enough. I use Pure for all my reference gathering and organising, and a lot of this I gathered at the very start. I knew the vibe I was going for. I had recently watched Love, Death and Robots and it inspired me a lot. I also loved the aesthetic of sci-fi junk and trash like in Destiny and Fallout. The pastel colours and brown rust is a really cool look. I found myself gathering reference all the time. Whenever I saw something on Instagram or ArtStation, I'd save it and add it to the ref sheet. I would love to work at Blizzard or Airship Syndicate one day, so I decided to go with a gnome look that could almost fit into the Warcraft universe. I also used a lot of just general hand-painted reference. This included screenshots out of World of Warcraft, textures I found an art station, and just screenshots of uh, things that I found as I worked on this, whether I was just on social media or Pinterest or art station. And I'd just grab screenshots, save it to my phone, and then import it into this pure ref sheet later on. My first lot of concepts were just quick and dirty sketches trying to get an idea down. When doing something like this, I love closing my eyes and imagining myself in the scene. Who is using it? What am I using it for? Why am I using it? I think this really helps develop the story and adds small bits of details I might miss otherwise. I did quickly realise there was no way I was going to get this much done in two weeks. Coming to these concepts, I knew what I wanted to do. So I decided just to simplify it. Use the elements I like and make some basic blockouts in Maya, adjusting composition and negative space to get the feel of the scale. Here I could just play around with the layout um, without committing too much to anything, decide what looks good, get rid of what doesn't look good, and just get a really good base going into my final sketches. I dropped my blockout screenshots into Photoshop and sketched my concepts over the top. These were my final three sketches. After this, I go back to Maya and build up the grey block model so I can start doing a paint over. I do some quick renders out of Maya and again in Photoshop start the paint over process. At this point I'm starting to think about how I'll model and UV the rest of the model. Here I started in black and white, then moved on to adding colours after my values felt right. And I also start to think about how I can reuse textures to make the process faster. When I start modelling the final model, I take my original block out mesh and just build off of that to make things easier. When I work on my final model and UVs, I actually tend to work in an exploded view, instancing my objects into my final scene setup. To do this, I use the duplicate special function. I duplicate the mesh with a minus one scale on the Z axis. Just be sure to select the instance option in the pop-up dialog box. This means any changes I make to the geometry or UVs on one side of the model will affect the instance geometry on the other side. And I can do this infinitely. This allows me to work on the straight X, Y, Z axis in Maya without needing to alter and reset pivots, speeding up my workflow. Here I again duplicate both parts and can now move them into my final setup scene. And as you can see, I can still edit all parts and have full editability of the object. You may notice when you try to rotate the model or move it, the pieces rotate on their own pivot. To fix this, I just group the objects together until they are ready to combine. This works on vertices, edges, faces, and UVs, so it's a really useful tool that speeds up my process. I will now go through and do this with all objects. 
I will usually edit the model the whole way through the process, not just during the modeling phase, but also while I'm texturing. In the case of this prop, about halfway through, I got some feedback and ended up making everything a lot chunkier. When working with my UVs, I try to keep everything as straight as possible. I do this within the UV toolkit by using straight UVs, although sometimes this gets confused and I will manually just scale down UV points and adjust them manually. This is time consuming, but it saves a lot of time when texturing. Another thing to keep in mind is texture density, making sure bigger objects have more space on the UV tile and smaller objects take up less space. Also, objects with less importance can use up less space because they require less texture density because of their visibility. I set up my UVs in two separate UV tiles. This is just during the unwrap process. In my workflow, it's important to assign the objects in each separate UV tile a separate material. I'll explain why in a second when we move into 3D code. Also make sure to go through and name all my objects. This makes it easier for sorting in 3D code. Before exporting, I move all my UVs onto the 0 and 1 UV tile. If I don't do this, everything outside of this tile won't bake any information in 3D code. Let's export and jump into 3D code where the magic happens. I import the scene into 3D code using the Paint UV Mapped Mesh option. In the dialog box, I make sure to keep UV selected and I also tick Treat Materials as Separate Textures. This is why earlier in Maya, I made sure to have the objects in each UV tile set with a different material. As you can see here, mine were basically UV1 and UV2. Once this is imported, I make sure to press 2 on my keyboard to go into unlit mode. I work in unlit mode because I knew I only wanted hand painted lighting information. I then created a new layer and named it AO. I then alt click the visibility icon in the paint object panel to isolate the meshes and bake my ambient occlusion into my AO layer. I make sure sphere plus hemisphere is selected and leave everything else default. I go through and do this with every object. I know I can press separate paint objects, but I find this does not really work for me, so I prefer to just do it myself. I then bake my curvature mat with default settings and set my AO to multiply and my curvature to overlay. Next up, I apply a top down gradient to my scene. I keep the colors black and white and I will colorize the maps in Photoshop later. I then set this layer to overlay. I don't worry too much about baking errors because I'll just be painting them out later. This is really just to get a base. I'll now press Ctrl P to export each map to Photoshop and save them individually to make them my working texture files. The first thing I do to make things a bit easier to see is I use the magic select tool to select outside of the wireframe layer. I then select all my layers and put them in a group and apply a mask. I then invert that mask. This lets me see where my mesh is for when I add my base colors. Now I just take the lasso or marquee tool, make my selection and fill it with my base color. Now I colorize my AO curvature maps with a hue saturation layer set to colorize. As a rule, I always make my AO a cool color and curvature a warmish color. This adds a lot of color depth. I then do the same with the gradient. I add a gradient map. Now this can be tuned to taste, but I usually color the shadows a purplish blue and the highlights a warmish orange. I then drag the adjustment layers into my second UV file and apply them to the same layers. This way I know everything is the same throughout. And I repeat the same process. Masking, base colors, colorizing maps. I will then jump into the Maya and apply my maps to my materials to see how it is looking. An important thing here is to change your Maya setting under the lighting tab to be flat lighting. And if you are working with alphas or shells, I enable two-sided lighting. I can now see some areas are too bright already. I can fix this easily by going into Photoshop and just adding levels adjustment. Always try to work within a clamp value range, not going black or white. Even though you will notice really dark areas on my textures, these are usually occluded areas that aren't visible. I will also go brighter if something is super metallic like my workbench. Now I'm ready to start painting. Once I have my base set up, I duplicate the group and flatten it. I keep the old group because sometimes the maps come in handy later. 
when I do this, I lose the dilation. And without this, if I save it in Maya, we can see the seams. So I use the dilation Photoshop action available on the Unity site. I run this and flatten everything. From there, there isn't much to it except locking transparency and starting to paint. I now just jump between Maya and Photoshop as I texture. I will occasionally export an object I need into 3D coat, paint out the seams, then re-export the texture back into Photoshop and just clipping mask it down onto my current layer before I flatten it. I like to take screenshots and check values in Photoshop. I do this by setting a black layer with blending to hue. This shows me quickly how my values are looking. Already here I can see some parts are too bright and others are too dark, like the seat and the top of the toolbox. When texturing, I try to work big shapes to small. I don't try to get too bound up in the details. The key really is just to start with a good base and build up from that. Also really like to play with color. Pushing grays, greens, reds, and other colors through your textures really makes them more vibrant and alive and really gives them a lot of character. Here on the battery, you can really see my original base and then how a little bit of work Adding some minor details and some color variation can add a whole lot of character and really take the texture to the next level. Here you can also see I changed my UVs. I just didn't like how they were stretching and I was finding it difficult to texture them. I changed everything around and then basically just cut and pasted my texture to suit the new UVs. As I mentioned earlier, this piece was done in two phases almost. Phase one was basically during the CGMA class. And phase two was just polishing with minor alterations to get it to a point that I liked it. The secret to this for me and something I learned during this course was just taking time. Taking time to polish your textures and asking for feedback. If you're into art, I highly recommend joining a community. I hadn't done so before this, but the feedback I got through communities was super helpful. Places like Stylized Station and Hand Painters Guild are a great resource if you want to check them out. I really like that during this piece, because of, I did it in two phases, I could really see the jump in skill. As you can see here by the original submission on the left and my final portfolio piece on the right. Now the major obstacles you can see here that I had to face in my final piece was the emissive map and getting it to look unique while using symmetrical UVs. And that's what I'm gonna briefly cover now. To do this, I duplicated only the meshes I knew would have the emissive map and deleted the faces I didn't need. I exported them and then imported into 3D coat the same as previous. Using the airbrush, I painted in the lighting, being mindful of where the seams are and not to paint over them because this would make them quite obvious because they would just cut off. I did a lot of isolating the objects, painting in and then removing, and I did do correction in Photoshop later. I then exported those maps to Photoshop and applied my masks and dilation as I did earlier. Now saving these as separate textures, I went back into Maya. Once in Maya, I created new materials for the emissive maps and applied it to the geometry, UV1 emissive and UV2 emissive. I deleted more faces that I didn't need. Because the geometry is on top of each other one to one, I had to inflate the emissive geometry. This was easy to do. I selected all the vertices and control middle mouse button clicked and drag on the move tool arrow and then just nudged it the slightest bit to inflate the geometry. This isn't visible to the viewer and it solves any clipping issues I have. I also realized my effects had some clipping issues. To solve this, I just changed the transparency algorithm in the viewport 2.0 settings to depth peeling. Now I'm ready to export for presentation. After exporting my model to FBX and saving my textures to Sketchfab, this is the final piece in the Sketchfab viewer online. After importing to Sketchfab, I go in and set up the scene. I make sure to set the scene as shadeless and add my textures to the texture library. I then connect all my textures as required to the corresponding geometry. To get the emissive effect in, I select the emissive geometry, apply my base diffuse to the base texture, and then apply the emissive map from 3D coat 
to the emissive channel. One of my favorite parts of Sketchfab is post-processing. I really liked how chromatic aberration looked. I thought it suited this piece. I spent a lot of time tweaking and just experimenting with all these settings to see what gave the best effect. One thing I really like is the screen space ambient occlusion that Sketchfab offers. Once I am happy with this, I publish the model and head over to the screenshot tool from Sketchfab Labs. You can find this on the Sketchfab website. It's super simple to use. I just input the desired resolution, adjust if I want post-processing effects and vignette, and press export. I open these up in Photoshop and drop them into a new document and compile them into my final portfolio renders. And this is the final piece, straight out of Sketchfab Exporter. And that concludes this breakdown. Thanks for watching. Thanks to the Stylized Station team for giving me this opportunity. If anything was unclear, leave a question in the comments because I'll be checking them out. And check out my art station if you want to see the other projects that were made during the CGMA course. If you're into 3D art, make sure to check out some Discord communities like the Hand Painters Guild and Stylized Station. Catch you next time.